There are many video game adaptations of movies that made it to home consoles, but looking at the NES library, the one that always intrigued me the most was Willow. Long before I had a chance to play it myself, the way that it looked and sounded captured my heart, and I hoped that the gameplay would rise up to match that quality when the time came. The game opens with the story of Bav Morda's descent into evil. She became lustful for the powers of dark magic and resisted all efforts to change her mind. In the conquest to take over the world, she raised an enormous army to destroy all that oppose her. But there's one person who's destined to save the world in this dire hour. Fate calls upon Willow to leave his life and his family behind, take up the sword, and put a stop to Bav Morda's wicked plans. The opening cutscenes and the little blurb in the manual put the story out on full display, but oddly, the back of the box's synopsis goes in a very different direction. This summary there is more in line with the events from the movie, and mentions the Child of Prophecy, as well as a group of companions rallying alongside the hero on his quest. The NES game, on the other hand, focuses on Willow as a lone traveler, with no child in tow, even though she's shown on the box art. Movie-based games either have the habit of following their source material too closely to a fault, or being so dissociated from it that they might as well be wearing their skin as a disguise. Willow falls somewhere smack in the middle of these two extremes. If you're familiar with the movie, you'll recognize a lot of people, places, and events, but they won't be part of the story in the way that you're used to. On the other hand, if you haven't seen the movie before, it won't stop you from enjoying the game as a fantasy adventure, with sword fights and magic as the foundation. I can understand the discrepancy between the in-game story and what's shown on the box, simply by wanting to draw fans of the movie into purchasing the experience on the NES, but it is unfortunate that the back of the box is misleading in what it chooses to emphasize, compared to what you'll actually play through during the adventure. The way that the story is built up in-game is wonderful. There's plenty of great source material to adapt to the video game world, and I especially love the way that NPC interactions were shown. Whether you're entering someone's home or discovering them while out and about, the quaint graphics and the little elements in each person's location perfectly captured the vibe of a classic fantasy setting. The third-person perspective in the conversation scenes was a unique take as well. Seeing Willow walk up to people for an exchange and then turn around to leave when the dialogue ended is something that I haven't seen elsewhere. The NPC portraits were also a clear cut above other games that tried to do something similar, like Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. Its featured gaping eye holes of doom are nowhere to be seen here, and it was clear that a lot of care went into the design of these aspects. Simply put, Willow is a very pretty game to look at. Many of the places that you travel to are overflowing with character, especially the many forests. The towns are large and sprawling, with some cute features like flowers and fences, though some of the NPC sprites standing around are not so polished, like this stack of tires with a head on top. Compared to these places, I found the mountains and the caves uninspired. The muted colors and repetitive graphics were not only dull, but they also made exploring these areas tedious. The landscapes lacked landmarks or other features to help navigate the labyrinthine passageways, and many of the layouts were repeated. On the bright side, even though these regions were large as a whole, they weren't overwhelmingly so, and because of the screen-by-screen -screen transitioning, it would have been easy enough to make a map if I'd needed one. Still, even a little bit more effort in these environments would have brought them much closer in line with the standards of the rest of the game. On the other hand, the music was consistently good throughout, with a couple of outstanding tunes like the one that plays in Knockmar Castle. My only gripe is that as good as some of the music was, in a handful of cases, the loops were on the short side and wore out their welcome after a while. This wasn't a regular issue given how often you enter the throes of battle while exploring, but I would strategically find places to do my pondering to get a break when certain tracks grew tiresome. After getting the primary directives for your quest and obtaining your first weapon, you can head off into the wilderness to start cutting your way around. Unlike other action RPGs, you won't automatically see the enemies you'll face off with on screen when you first enter. They'll only appear after a little transition in visuals and music, which was one of my favorite things. The wind picks up and blows through the grass and trees right before foes pop in for some action. The windup was nice and quick and didn't disrupt the game's flow at all, and having that cue also added some suspense to the wandering. You could trigger a brawl in the middle of a screen and suddenly find yourself surrounded, or it might not happen at all. Along with the element of surprise, I enjoyed the strategy that came out of this setup. Some screens have enemies that always appear in the same configuration, and you can learn to anticipate them. With that knowledge, you can re-enter a screen to position yourself better or even despawn a fight if you need to save your strength. Another benefit is that you can almost always run from battles with very few exceptions. When I was barely hanging on with only a few HP left, I really appreciated having my character's stats displayed in the top corner at all times too. 
This way, if I entered a screen with a horrible monster, I knew exactly where I was at health-wise and could make that snap decision on whether to fight or run. I wish more games had been this transparent in how health was displayed on screen, rather than forcing you to interpret a health bar graphic or some other metric instead. The enemies were very well suited to this game's beautiful world, and you'll come across skeletons and skeletal accessories, giant beasts, dragons, as well as many otherworldly creatures that will really kick your butt until you learn how to fight them. Unfortunately, there's not as much variety as you might find in other adventures, since palette swaps are extremely common for higher level enemies. Unless I was on death's door, I chose to fight nearly everything I encountered with the exception of those jerks that turn you into a pig because I just hate them. The manual tells you that you need to be at a specific level in order to save Finn Rizal from her fate as a forever opossum, and I didn't dare let myself fall short by avoiding enemies. For the most part, the combat felt pretty routine, and I mean that in the best way possible. I was happy with the variety of battle options like ranged and melee attacks with magic and weapons respectively, but I also enjoyed the variations in close range sparring. Willow can either poke at enemies if you swing his sword while he's moving, or sweep in a wider arc if he's standing still. This breadth attack is a welcome change from the typical precision requiring jabs of other action games, especially because enemies don't always move exclusively in the four directions that you're restricted to poking in. If I have one complaint, there was a mechanic pertaining to special weapons that wasn't very well implemented. Certain monster types are completely immune to physical attacks unless you hit them with a particular sword, so if you want to kill them, you'll need to switch between several weapons regularly in the menu. This is great in principle, since you'll get to use your inventory for more than just strength alone, but in a couple of caves, every other room had enemies that were invincible against one of your weapons, forcing you to switch way too often. It slowed down those stretches of the game so much and made them feel monotonous compared to areas where this wasn't a concern. Thankfully, this was only a demand on my patience a couple of times throughout the entire game, but I've never wanted a shoulder button to flip between inventory items more than I did in those moments. Much of the beginning of the game felt comfortably easy, but that all came crashing down when I reached a section that left me begging for mercy. In this coastal area, there are the most evil crabs in all of video game history that just hurl themselves at you and absolutely wreck you if you're under-leveled. They have a very small window of vulnerability and extremely high defense, and it also doesn't help that they home straight for you. They typically appear on a very narrow strip of land where it's hard to outmaneuver them as well, and I died by their giant claws far too many times to count. You may be wondering if I was up to my hoarding ways and not healing up enough with these fights, but for once, the answer is that I had no choice in the matter. Willow paces equipment upgrades and finding special items very well to help cushion the blow of these suddenly tougher encounters, but I learned the hard way that you can cross several points of no return and miss some items permanently. This happened to me with the heal mace. I finished a quest and never followed up with the person that was supposed to give it to me, and by the time that I realized it, I'd gone far too forward in the plot to go back for it. I could have tried loading up an earlier password, but since I had no idea exactly when that event had passed me by, the only other options were to start over or keep going without it. I chose the latter and continued playing on what was essentially hard mode with no ability to regain HP on the go until later in the game. I was able to compensate for this by walking back to houses with healers as needed. This wasn't all bad since I got to do some extra grinding with all the doubling back. In terms of its MP cost, spellcasting in Willow was completely reasonable. I very rarely used any of the offensive magic and preferred physical tactics instead, though there was a fairly decent spell arsenal to choose from. Once I finally had a healing item to my name, I used it often, and I rarely felt like I was running short on MP. With a lack of other supporting characters to lean on, it was really nice that you had such a large MP pool by the end of the game. Along with learning magic every so often, there were also quite a few equipment upgrades to enjoy. Instead of having to visit multiple shops or buy stuff every time you reached a new town, these items are either found or given over to drive the story forward. In fact, you don't even have to worry about buying anything ever since there isn't any currency to worry about. Many plot points are propelled entirely by item trade, which was a nice reprieve from the financial pressures in other games. With respect to weapons and armor, a general rule was that if you got something new, it was probably better than what you already had. The menu does have item stats on full display for easy comparisons of different pieces, and the only thing holding this system back from perfection was the absence of item descriptions. Sometimes I'd pick something up and learn it by name only, but have no idea about its purpose, and it'd go on to burn a hole in my pocket forever more after that. The manual's also extremely vague on this front, so much so that it even encourages experimentation with weapons and items to see how they work. 
I prefer transparency in these matters, so if an NPC or an item name didn't really reveal something's purpose to me, I was content never to try it out. There was something odd in Willow that I haven't encountered in any other game. When you die and select continue, you respawn back at the last checkpoint that you reached, just like you'd expect. But what's weird is that whatever armor and weapon you were using are no longer equipped. I can't tell you how many times I'd come back from death and be so anxious to get back into the action that I'd end up on an unarmed stroll through the forest without realizing it. I'd usually remember in time and avoid dying a horrible death, but it felt like a bizarre decision to bring me back unclothed and empty-handed. When he does have gear on, Willow's character sprite shows a little sword and shield, but as usual, I wished for some variety when different equipment was worn for a break from the plain white stuff that you see the whole game. At least they consistently kept him right-handed most of the time. You don't always see that kind of detail in sprite work. Boss fights were not anything to write home about, and were actually quite a big letdown. They weren't really all that challenging, save for a few that really force you to strategize. Most of them could be overcome by cornering them and eating some projectile hits while hammering down with the sword. The real challenge of Willow came from trying to understand where to go most of the time. The translation is above average, but even with a clear task on my radar, sometimes it felt like a wild goose chase trying to make progress. For example, there was one instance where I was asked to find an NPC and speak to them to advance the plot. I remembered seeing them a while back, so I returned to that place, but they were nowhere to be found. Feeling puzzled, I started combing through all of the previous villages I'd been to up until that point, and I spoke to everyone else again, trying to find some clue that I might have missed to give me some direction. I came up empty, and after trying everything logical I could think of, I just started wandering around through the forests and finally found that person hanging out on one of the paths for no reason that I could link to the plot. It's entirely possible that someone somewhere that I missed had the tidbit that I needed to redirect me. This was one of several times where the game left me hanging like this. It was easy enough to stay positive since every step in an RPG is one step closer to a new level, but more clarity would have been a welcome addition to what is otherwise a pretty well-written game. Willow for the NES is an experience that has a little bit of everything that makes an adventure extraordinary. Interesting characters, excellent graphics paired with a memorable soundtrack, and some well-executed action to round it all out. Even with its handful of flaws, like an occasional convoluted story point or some boring graphics as you travel through the many dark colons of this ancient land, it's at least as good as, or in some cases even exceeds, the awesomeness of many other games in this style that were out at the time. Embarking on this quest is an absolute necessity for any lover of action RPGs, especially if you enjoyed the movie and want a slightly remixed version of its world and the people within it. That said, even if you haven't seen the film or don't really care for it, there's an engaging game to take in with all the mystery and fantasy that you could want from this era of gaming, and it should not be missed.